And welcome to Two Steps Ahead. I'm Son Edom, alongside my friend and colleague, Tara Hoke Shiro. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a few things, but the main thing is going to be talking about decisions. A lot of things in life come down to the decisions that we make. Are they good decisions? Are they bad decisions? Or is the fear of making a decision mm. keeping you from actually trying something? And so that's going to be the topic for today. Glad to have you along. And uh, Tara, it's going to be an interesting t- conversation because that seems to be the number one thing that people have a problem with is decision making. They're afraid to make the bad decision. It's kind of like in, in a mm-hmm. sport. It's like some people want the ball at the buzzer. And others want to pass it off. And that's kind of like the decision-making process. Are you going to be one that's going to take the shot at the buzzer, either make it or break it? Or do you want to pass it off and let someone else decide for you? And so uh, decision-making is a huge huge thing. It is a huge thing. And of course, if you know me very well at all, I love to start off with definitions. Like what the heck is a decision anyway, which is simply what? It's a, it's, a, it's a determination made after consideration, right? And so it's that consideration part that we think about. And I also like to break it down into two steps. So there's a direct decision and there's an indirect decision. And I would say that those direct decisions are the, the decisions that you were talking about in life, those major life um, benchmarks that we think about, like where should I go to school? What should I major in? Who should I get married to? What job should I have? What career should I have? And then goes on from there, marriage, kids, buying a house, where do you live, you know, retirement, all of that. So those are the direct decisions that we have a tendency to make that we think are going to keep us on the right track or they can kind of trip us up. We can get stuck in making those. But then it's those indirect decisions that we make on a daily basis that are off of our radar. Those are the ones that that trip us up and keep us from accomplishing those bigger decisions. So maybe an example. So like, let's say somebody says, um, well, I'm in college and I have a job. And, you know, so I'm headed towards, you know, my future. But then those indirect decisions, you know, we sleep in, we miss a class, we're out partying, um, we lie on a test. There's all these little things that we decide to do on a daily basis that kind of trip us up that can and those are the what builds our character. And that's what either um, moves us forward or brings us back. You know, you mentioned uh, students, college students. I teach at Passing the City College in the radio department, radio broadcasting. And I had a student that missed the first day of school in the fall. And the decision, they just missed the first day of school. She missed the first day of school. Mm -hmm. And so she thought that she might not come back to school. She was kind of upset she missed the first day of school and decided well, should I go back to school? Should I just drop out? What should I do? She decided to come back to school the next the next day, which was the two days later. And now she's gone on. She has a, a radio show on our campus radio station, and she's doing some peer counseling and some other things. But I'm, I'm shocked to think that what if her decision not to return would have been the decision, what she would be doing now, compared to the decision to come back and all the things that she's accomplishing, all the people that she's helping, all mm-hmm. the things that are going on in her life, which are positive now. And so sometimes, you know, the decision to, to do something can be a difficult one. And to get a little bit more, uh, maybe not so controversial, but a little bit more deeper into it, you know, I know you're from Ohio. You're a Buckeye. <laughs> the only thing I don't like about you is the Buckeyes. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> me being a Trojan fan. So I went to a game recently, and it was a big win for USC. And I was thinking about afterwards. You know, I'm, I'm leaving the game, and it's campus, and everyone's out there having a good time. And I started to think about, okay, how many lives are going to be changed here on this night because of a decision, whether it's to drink too much, whether it's to party too much, whatever the decision is, and how many lives are going to be affected by that. And that was something that kind of stuck into my mind about when you talk about decisions is, you know, even at a younger age, the decisions that we make at at that time in the moment could be life altering, maybe long term, or maybe just short term, It, it depends. So those are the indirect decisions that I would say that cause us to because we cause us to get off track. And I like to think of it as a kind of like a if you have like two rocket ships and they're you know side by side and if they're if their flight plans are just one centimeter off you know pretty soon they're often in the opposite direction and on a completely different planet and we say you know how did we get here and so they're in college you know they're making that direct decision of being in college so they can say okay my intent is 
that I'm going after this particular career goal or this particular goal in life and I'm in college. And so they, we think that we're doing you know, the right thing because we're following that direct decision. But those indirect decisions, oftentimes, you know, whether or not I go to the party, how much I drink, who do I go home with, um, whether or not to, to miss the first day of class or to, you know, to show up late, all of those little decisions we don't think are important because we're, we're going to college, right? So we're fulfilling, we're checking off the box. But it's those indirect, and, and I made a list, surprise, because I like lists, I like to write things down. So a lot of these indirect decisions that people make, like you're um, saying, are based on our need for fulfillment, our need for peace, um, loneliness, whether or not we're hungry, if we have um, fear, what desires we have, if we're trying to please other people, safety, security, whether or not we feel accepted or validated, if we're looking for comfort. Those are those little things that cause us to make decisions contrary to what we would look at the bigger decision and then we don't understand why we're off track. And and like you said, one little decision can change our lives, but they're off of our radar. We don't think that we need to pay attention to those decisions. So I think when you mentioned loneliness, I think loneliness is a big part, especially for younger people and anybody really um, in decision making. You know, you want to be accepted. You don't want to be alone. I think of like New Year's Eve. Everybody wants to go out and have that New Year's Eve party experience, have a good time, be with people. But I found over the years, because when I'm usually in bed at nine, <laughs> on New Year's Eve because I'm up at four because I'm at the Rose Parade for my job and uh, we broadcast it on our campus radio station awesome. and so I'm in bed early but over the years I've been talking to people and I find that a lot of people end up watching the ball drop on TV because they have nobody and mm-hmm. they're just there alone mm-hmm. and so then they decide okay well this year and I guess the number one or one of the biggest resolutions that people have at the new year is A join the gym which <laughs> ends 30 days later when the month is up and then B is you know to find somebody you know maybe they go on the dating apps or whatever the case may be to try to find somebody because being lonely is uh, not fun as people would say and so I think that kind of when you mention that list and you talk about loneliness, I think that's a huge factor in people's mm-hmm. decisions. Acceptance would be another one. You mm-hmm. know, they don't want to be, how many times have people been peer pressured into doing something because, and it's, it's a bad decision, because they want to be accepted. Right. You know? So I would say that because we're talking about, you know, bigger decisions versus smaller decisions, I would say that it's very important to take a look at those smaller decisions that we're making on a daily basis that might be causing us to, um, get exactly what we don't want so let's say for example we're making decisions because we're lonely so we decide to start dating somebody that um, there's red flags all over the place and we choose to ignore the red flags because it's like well who else uh, is going to want me who else is going to want to date me so at least i'll have somebody well then this somebody hurts us and causes chaos in our life and then we have even more problems and then we're stuck in this relationship and we don't know how to get out of it and if we break up with them then we're going to be lonely again and so the decision isn't necessarily this bigger like okay i want to be with someone i i you know want to get married and be safe and secure the decision might be um, why am I so lonely and, and why do I not have a community of friends around me to fill in those gaps so I'm not looking for all of those um, emotional relationship things that I need in one person? And then so so sometimes the decision has to be I need to look inside myself and find out what is lacking so that I don't go and, and take care of it in the wrong way and then take me completely off course. I think one of the biggest things that I read is, especially with younger people, is I guess when they go to therapy or talk to somebody, counseling or whatever, the biggest discussion that they have is that of decision making. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do for my career? What am I going to do for my job? What am I going to study in school? What relationship am I going to have? What are some of the big decisions in life that I need to make? And I'm concerned that I'm going to make the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. So I guess it would be okay. So once you make a decision or how do you go about making that decision would be the thing to Mm -hmm. have to figure out because are you going to pull the trigger on choosing someone you're going to date or are you going to kind of hem and haw and kind of wait on that? So let's talk about that. How let's 
let's use us for an example. Like, how do you make decisions? What is your process for decision making? So me, I'm kind of like, I would have been a great lawyer. I would have, I would have been, a, I would have been like, you know, any, any lawyer movie that you ever saw where they like, you know, Tom Cruise got the guy to admit the code red, you know, stuff like that. Right. That would have been me. Okay. Cause I take a look at all the angles. I take a look at all the information. I take a look at everything that I possibly can. And, and I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on it, but I look at all the angles and then I make a decision based on all the information that I can have. It's about the information. Mm-hmm. And then I decide. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it could be a small decision like, you know, okay, what am I going to do for class today? Maybe it's a bigger decision, like where am I going to go on vacation? Or maybe it's something more impactful, like how am I going to interact with you know, coworkers? Or if someone's really pissing me off, how am I going to handle that situation? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't really necessarily have a knee-jerk reaction most of the time because I want to take and consider all the angles. Because like you were talking about direct and indirect, my direct decision to my bitchy coworker might have indirect negative effects. Mm-hmm. So I want to take sh- make sure that whatever I decide here isn't going to, you know, negatively affect other people or right. might not, uh, you know, h- how that's going to play out. Right. And so I like to take a look at all the angles, all the information and then make a decision that I think is best. Um, so I'm so. pretty similar with that. Um, I like to I kind of en- envision because I'm a I'm a writer, I'm an author and I edited a lot of books for other writers. And what I often notice is that people would come in, um, for those of you that can see us on camera, they would come in with their book attached to their chest. And any comment or any critique that we would need to talk about, like who is the audience or what shelf on the bookshelf um, it's going to sit on, they would take everything personal because it was attached to their chest. I like to put the problem on the table out here so it's not personal per se. And like you said, look at all the angles, but I like to look at the pros and cons. I like to look at how it's going to affect, you know, what the ripple effect is going to be. So for example, if we're talking about, you know, where to put the chair in the living room or how to, how to rearrange the backyard, what is the best decision for that specific problem? And sometimes we have to make a decision that we don't like or some, or a decision that's uncomfortable. And so if we keep it um, centered on the problem itself and, ba- and and solve that problem based on its own merits and not take it personal, then we can make better decisions. But I think part some of this that where we get tripped up in, in our personal decision making process is that taking all the pieces into consideration, like you said, that's our core values. That's our passions. That's our skill sets. That's our needs and our desires and our wants. That's everything that that we have in our life and who we are, who it is that we are bringing to the table. Um, because when we don't consider that, so for example, I coach at an office and I'm very good at identifying the problem. I'm very good at um, breaking down the problem into the different parts and, and coming up with a strategy to solve the problem. I'm not so good at hospitality. I'm not so good at being a cheerleader. I'm in my head a lot. I'm thinking a lot. And that doesn't necessarily play well to a team builder. You know, if I'm going to be the team builder in the office, um, I'm not the one that will walk into the office and be like, hey, guys, how's everybody's day? I'm the one that's like, okay, where's the coffee? And please don't talk to me until 10 o'clock, right? You can't be a team builder with that type of of a personality and if we're not completely self-aware of ourselves then we get ourselves into situations and we make decisions that are not good for us because we don't know who we are we don't know our core values and we don't know what makes us tick we don't know what our guiding principles are and so when so i think the first step if we were going to give some tips is in in these major life decisions is to write out our core values, the positive ones and the negative ones. And a core value is simply something that drives your behavior. So I'm a learner and I'm driven to read and write because that's just what I do. It's like breathing for me. Other people are, you know, hospitality. And so they wanna go and talk to everybody in the grocery store, everybody in the coffee shop. That's what drives their behavior, right? Some people's um, behavior is driven by comfort. And so when it comes to making a hard decision where they're not going to be comfortable, they can't make the right decision because their core value is comfort and they're going to shrink back and be afraid 
um, to, to make the decision that they need to. So I think the first step is knowing who we are, take all those self-assessment tests, figure out our core values, really take the time to get a, a good grip on our personality and who we are. Um, and then we know who we're bringing to that process. So I'll give you an example of, of kind of my decision-making process. So I had just gotten a job at uh, KLAC, which at the time was the Lakers radio station, and I was working the afternoon show. It was a four, uh, noon to three, then it got moved to noon to four. But um, I'd just gotten there, and I just started producing the Loose Cannons, and I got a call from a guy in Sacramento. He wanted to know if I'd be interested in working – a job that was a little unique. It had a couple components to it. One, I would produce a, an afternoon show. Two, I would be a part of the Sacramento Kings NBA basketball team's broadcast hmm. in a pregame and postgame kind of situation. And then three, there were some other elements involved that were kind of tertiary. And so I thought, hey, that would be cool. You know, be a part of the, the NBA maybe. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, who knows where that would go. So I started to think about it. And I'm thinking, okay, Sacramento versus L.A. Obviously, L.A. is way better than Sacramento. <laughs> uh, producing the show obviously fell towards L.A. because I loved working with the guys that I was working with, Steve Hartman, Michael Thompson, Vic the Brick Jacobs. And then it got to the NBA part. And I was thinking, you know, this could be a pretty big career move if it pays off, you know, be a part of the NBA. Mm -hmm. And you never know what happens. Once you get in, you never know where it's going to lead. Right. You know, if maybe you're doing pre and post game and then, because I've seen it happen and then maybe you're doing other things and one of my goals in life was to do play-by-play -play and to do, you know, and maybe this would lead the door or, or open the door for a play-by-play -play job in the NBA or who knows what, you know, you never know. Mm -hmm. And so I molded over and I thought about it and I decided after taking in all the information that I would stay where I was at. Even though I kind of knew that the position that I was going to be in was at its ceiling, if that makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. I kind of knew this is going to be me for the next however long until they got rid of me. Going to Sacramento, I did not know what the potential would be or what the outcome would be, but the potential could have been pretty big. Right. So I decided to stay. And um, in hindsight, you know, obviously, who knows, 2020, hindsight's 2020, but I liked and I made that decision and I was happy with it because now where I'm at today, I'm fine with where I'm at, but who knows what would have happened. Mm -hmm. But I started thinking about that you know, every so often when I talk about, you know, things that I've done in my life with uh, students and stuff, but uh, I often wonder what would have happened if I took the job. So what was the determining factor that caused you not to take the job? Like what were some of the pros and cons that you were weighing? So the, 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 main, the main thing was the uncertainty of the future because mm -hmm. there were so many, like, there, like I said, there were three dimensions to the job and it wasn't just one solid. It was like, okay, you're going to work for the radio station as a producer of the show. So my thought was, okay, what if that show goes away and I'm in Sacramento? Mm -hmm. If my show went away in LA, I would have more connections to find another job, I would be home, and there'd be other things. The NBA, I did not know how that was gonna pan out, you know, um, because it's such a, um, you know, you're here today, gone tomorrow type mm -hmm. of thing. Right. Um, and then third was just the idea that there's three different components, three different paychecks coming in, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. So there was, you know, some monetary decisions to be made. Mm -hmm. um, and so that ultimately decided that the, the best bet was my goal, and plus my goals. My goal was to make it in LA, New York, Chicago, one of the top three radio markets in the business. Okay. And Sacramento's not New York, LA, or Chicago <laughs> by far, if you've been up there. Um, and so I just, that's part of the reason why I decided to stay. And I'm glad I did, but I never know what the future you know would have been. On the flip side. Well, okay? so you would say that security and stability won out over risk and In this particular adventure. instance, yes, yes. Here's another example. Mm -hmm. So a few months back, an opportunity came up my way, and I decided that I'd pursue it. And you talk about you know, knowing yourself, and you talk about um, your character, and you know all that type of thing. Okay. So an opportunity came up, and it was uh, a little bit of a risk, but I decided that I would jump at the opportunity because you're talking about risk, right? Right. Because I thought it would work out. I thought it would be a good opportunity. The signs there were like, this is going to be good. Well, after a couple of weeks, it just dropped. It died. Mm -hmm. And it left me like no no reason, no rhyme as to why it ended or what went, you know, what happened to cause it to end. And even today when I think about it, it kind of stings a little bit because you start to second guess yourself. Right. And you start to realize, okay, well, if I known myself, I should not have taken that risk because that's not me. But I decided to take the risk anyways. It backfired, it didn't work out. 
it stings when I think about it, mm-hmm. but it's a decision that I made. So sometimes the decisions can be ones that work out, like staying in LA right. versus going to Sacramento. You know, both decisions could have been good ones, but I decided because of security and and you know what I know, comfort. And then the other one was, you know, I got burned and um, it didn't work out. So there's going to be times where decisions that you make you think are going to be good. Mm-hmm. You might take that risk. It might pay off. I took a risk going to Iowa for my first radio job when I didn't even know where Iowa was on the map practically. Right. And it paid off because it opened the door to my career. But then in a situation like this, you know, it, it, it didn't work out. And then you start kicking yourself thinking, man, I shouldn't have done that. Why did I do that? Why did I go against, you know, kind of my core values and mm-hmm. things like that? Mm-hmm. And it wasn't anything bad or salacious, but it was just a decision to try to take a risk on something. Right. And it didn't work out. And that's a part of life, too. So sometimes the decisions can be good ones. I don't say it was a bad decision that I made. Mm-hmm. It just didn't work out. As long as we learn from those decisions, then they're all good decisions. Because sometimes the only way we can learn is from trying something and failing and then saying, okay, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? Am I off track? Was I on track? Were there other um, things out of my control? So as long as we are learning from our decisions and using them for the next decision, I think that that's, you know, that's the way that life goes. But it seems that we're so afraid of making the wrong decision that it holds us back because we hear stories like, oh, you know, look at all the time that was wasted or look at the energy and the resources that were wasted on that decision. And so then we get paralyzed thinking, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go down the wrong track. And then we have trouble making any kind of a decision and then we stay stuck. So I would say, again, you know, not only knowing who we are, but knowing what our goals are. And we may not be able to explain our super long-term goals, especially if we're in our 20s, but we at least have sooner, you know, five, 10-year goals, you know, graduating college or getting a job. And, And I think that if we stay in those areas um, and and pay attention to what is driving us and pay attention to, you know, this list of of indirect um, decisions that we make on a daily basis. There's a a story that there was a, um, I was in a restaurant with a friend of mine um, several years ago and this waitress said she came and, and she was a very talkative and she just started volunteering this story about her brother. And she was saying, oh, my brother is dating this girl and she's so mean to him and she takes, she wants him to buy all this expensive stuff and he can't afford it and she's taking all of his money. And when she um, comes over to our house, she's mean to my parents, she's mean to me and she completely ruined our other siblings wedding because uh, we told this girlfriend that she couldn't come and then she kept calling and calling and my brother had to keep answering the phone every five minutes and it completely ruined the wedding and I don't remember if it was me or the lady I was with, but one of us said, what is wrong with your brother? And she, the blood kind of drained out of her face and she says, what do you mean? And I said, why would he allow someone to treat him that way? And why would he bring her home so that she can treat you and your parents that way? And why doesn't he say no if she wants to spend, why doesn't he break up with her? Like, why is he allowing all this chaos into your family? And she had she had no response she was floored it hadn't even occurred to her that he could make a different decision that he could say no that he could set up a boundary against her they were blaming everything on this girlfriend and how awful she was but not realizing that they could make a decision to end that so so again it's that you know what did the brother need and i think that um we could say that he needed love and he was probably thinking that if he didn't stay with this girl then you know who else was he going to be with and so he allowed all of this pain in his life um rather than you know taking charge of himself and and putting an end to that so it it becomes tricky because when we when we start off in our 20s and 30s we think that it's these big life decisions that we're going to make you know again you know where to go to college what to study what kind of a job who to marry where to live you know and on and on but it's those other decisions that we don't um, that we don't pay attention to because and if we don't pay attention to them the ante keeps getting the ante is raising uh, the older that we get right then we have to decide are we going to forgive someone then we have to decide 
Um, if we're going to let someone treat us this way, are we going to decide to cheat on our spouse? Are we going to decide to um, lie at our job or or um, quit so that we're not involved in the boss's, you know, um, you know, nefarious, you know, business tactics? The decisions get more and more complicated as we get older. And so if we can learn to make those decisions in the short term, you know, those character decisions, you know, if we're lonely, why are we not, why are we choosing to satisfy the loneliness as opposed to get rid of the loneliness? Because that's what trips us up. That's what will take us and land us on a completely other planet. If we, we, we think we're supposed to decide who to date, but really we need to decide to not be lonely and to get a community around us and to immerse ourselves into a group of people that will love on us and not ask us for romance in return to get our soul fulfilled. Well, it goes back to also to the second part of that would be influences. You know, we talked about it before you, when we're talking about success and measures of success, you know, who's influencing or who's defining our success. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, you know, what's success and border bullies and these types of things. But now who's influencing your decision-making process? That's the next thing. Because right. if you have this case that you're talking about, is this girlfriend influencing the guy? And is that influence stronger than the rest of the influence? And so he's making bad decisions. You know, peer pressure, when you're talking about, you know, younger kids in high school doing things and being peer pressured into having sex or being peer pressured into trying drugs or drinking or smoking, you know, there's an influence being put upon that decision. Right. And so you talk about, you know, having character and knowing yourself and knowing your character, but it's also the people around you who's going to be influencing you and what mm -hmm. kind of decisions are going to be made based on that influence. You know, are people going to cheat on a test? Who's influencing them? That. Or if you've got people saying, hey, this would be a great job for you to do, and it's really a good job, are you going to listen to that mm -hmm. and make a decision based on it? So when you get back to the decision-making process with information, you also have to consider the people that are influencing you and who are giving you the advice in that effort for you to make that right. decision. And I would say that if people are not accepting your no, those are not your friends. That's a really good test to, to figure out the people that you have in your circle, the people that are influencing you and asking you maybe to do things that are against what you think that you should be doing for yourself. And if you say no to someone, if they accept your no, then that's a good friend. But if they don't accept your no, if they get um, their feelings hurt or they get offended or they start attacking you or making fun of you, then that is not your friend. Those are not your people. And you're being influenced by someone who is taking advantage of you or wanting you in their circle for their own selfish purposes. It's not, it's not about you at that point. And so our friends and our influences, we need to be around people who are for us, people who we can trust not only with our, our secrets, but people who will go to bat for us, people who will allow us to be ourselves, allow us to say no, allow us to say yes, even if they don't. Um, agree with us, but they will love us anyway. Those are the true friends that we should um, seek out and and be influenced by. And if we're being influenced by people who are hurting us, then you know I would say that there's probably something you know fear or people pleasing that we have a problem with um, codependency. Maybe we have a lack of boundaries. These are all things that play into our decisions to be around people that hurt us, to be around people who um, don't respect our no and, and, and are not for us. So it's complicated. Decisions are complicated because there's influences, there's, you know, core values, there's, you know, big benchmarks that we want to achieve in life. But, you know, when we get right down to it, those decisions, you know, it's those direct decisions that we think are taking us in the right direction. I'm going to buy a car. I'm going to get this job. But those indirect decisions, I'm going to go hang around this person just because I don't have anybody else to hang around with. That is what's going to take your rocket and land you on a completely different planet. And then when you're 30, 40, 50, you're like, how the heck did I get here? I wasn't intending to get here. How did I get here? And it's those little. But see, that's so hard for people because when people are in that situation, and they're alone and they want to hang out with somebody, you know, they'll take anybody regardless of that influence. And so that makes it even much more difficult for a person because it's harder. It's in, in, and in my experience, I've seen that it's for people, it's better to be with somebody that is a bad influence than to be alone. 
Right. Nobody wants to be alone. They'd rather right. be with somebody. It's kind of like, if you remember the movie, I don't know if you saw the movie, Some Kind of Wonderful. I did not. Okay. It's an 80s, 80s movie, 80s high schoolish movie. And so at the end, the, um, the character's talking about, um, uh, Amanda Jones is the character's name. And she's talking about being with somebody that she would be, she'd rather be with somebody for all the wrong, wrong reasons than be alone. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the movie, she realizes that she'd rather be alone and right than be alone and wrong, basically. So, you know, she kind of had, I guess, a coming See, to Jesus moment. That is sad to me because we're, we're taking it as, I'm assuming, you, uh, being alone meaning a boyfriend, right? Yeah, I was talking about relationships, yeah. Right, so she was right. in a relationship with somebody so, and the guy was a bad dude, but yeah. she'd rather be with him. And as the movie... You know, if you've seen it, as the movie goes on, he's doing some, you know, bad things, you know, to her um, it's, it's, and, you know, not being a good guy, good guy to her. Mm-hmm. And so, but she'd rather stick with him because she doesn't want to be alone. Right. But so they, here's the, here's the thing about relationships and about, again, the decisions that we make, the people that we're around. I don't see this as an either or I'm lonely if I'm not with a, someone I'm going to be, you know, lonely or, and if I'm with someone, okay, that satisfies the loneliness box. There's, there are friends, there are girlfriends, there are boyfriends that we can have in our circle that fill us with all of those needs of community that we desire so that we don't have to feel like we have to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend so that we're not lonely. We can get those needs met in so many other places. And then when we're ready for the romantic part, then we... But see, also then gets harder as you get older because more and more people end up in relationships. And then once, okay, so you have your group of friends. Mm -hmm. Friend A gets married. Now they're out of the group. Friend B gets married. Now they're out of the group because they go live their lives. And pretty soon you're like the last one standing. And then you're like, what do you do? Because all my friends, so now do I have to go find new friends? Do I have to go find new peer groups Yes. to make those decisions? Yes. Then how do I go doing that with my work schedule, with my job, with everything else that's going on? Mm-hmm. So then it becomes a whole new like starting over again as yes. you get older. If you're not one of those people that gets involved in a relationship and then, you know, moves on. And then you're the last person standing. And then that's where... It becomes difficult at times because now you've got a whole slew of decisions to make. What are these new friends going to be like? Where are we going to meet them? Uh, I know dating apps are huge uh, for people to to go online, and you know it's it's gotten to the point where you look at a picture and you swipe right or swipe left to make that decision as to whether or not you're mm-hmm. going to like somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like it's almost like it's become the dumbing down of that decision making process based on an, on an appearance or something. But that's what it's become to. So it's, let's go back though for a, for a second because because now we're going back to saying that in order to satisfy the loneliness that we are we need to be with you know a a boyfriend or a girlfriend right Right. so part sometimes we have to decide to be an adult right and so when we get sucked into this um oh now i have to go look and and find a new group of friends because all of my friends got married and now everybody's coupling off and i'm the last one standing well to take care of ourselves as an adult one of the things that we have to do is to reach out for what we need. And for some of us, that's really hard. Like I could not do that for years. I wanted people to come to me. I wanted people to choose me. I wanted friends to choose me. I flat out told my friend, um, Kathy, when, um, when she met, she says, Oh, let's be friends. And I said, if you want to be friends, you're going to have to call me. I'm not going to call you because I was done with people. I'd been hurt too many times and I was done and I didn't need anybody else. So she did. She called me. And I went over and we had lunch and then she called me again. And now we're great friends because she earned my trust. But that was a time in my life where I was not going to reach out. I was not acting like an adult in that situation. I was hurt. I was wounded. I had all types of rejection and abandonment issues. And so we don't get a pass as an adult. We don't get to use that excuse that I've had rejection or abandonment issues. I've had people hurt me. And so now I have to go look for a new group of friends. Yes, that's called being an adult. So there are peer groups, there are support groups, there are life groups. If you're you know, a member of a church, a lot of the churches around here have life groups, um, which is just simply a gathering of, of people who get together on a regular basis and do life together. And they're single, they're divorced, they're widowed, they're married all kinds of things, but it's, you find your people. And so part, so we have to reach out for what we need rather than getting sucked into this trap of, 
oh, now I got to go find new people. So let me just go on a dating app. This is a lot easier. Let me just find someone, you know, a romantic interest to be involved with. That doesn't solve the problem that we have so many needs and desires and, and things inside of us that it takes a community to fill. Like I had this conversation with my daughter one time and she was upset that one of her friends wasn't um, being the way that she wanted her to be. And I said, look, you have a friend that you traveled with. You have a friend that you talk academic stuff with. You have a friend that you go shopping with. You have a friend that you go to the beach with. Not, You don't have one person to fulfill all the things in your life. You have 10 people and, and those 10 people can fill each 10 parts of your soul. It's not just one person. And so, yeah, we do need to go out and find new people and, and, and get what we need as an adult. I'm talking into my best friend. The microphone's my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> my friend, my only friend, my microphone, my mistress, everything is in I'm one so right sad. here. My I'm microphone so is everything. It Aww. fulfills everything that I need. Um, no, but no, but here, here's, here's something interesting. Okay, so I've had the opportunity to, well, I guess it depends on your perspective, but the opportunity to bounce around from town to town in my younger days, radio station to radio station. Okay. So I've had to meet new people along the way. Now, fortunately, with the radio business, you can meet people pretty quickly because they hear you on the radio and all of a sudden, you know, now you got stalkers. And so it's easy to meet people. So I don't have my you stalkers. Fans. Well, okay, fans. <laughs> fans that will do your laundry for you. Fans that will show up at the radio station, bring you food. There's so many fans. Uh, stalkers that will like, you They're know, be at every event. They're knocking the door event. right now. Uh, no, but so you have, so it's a little bit easier to, to meet people, but you still have to go out and, and be available to, to meet the people and to, and to meet new peer groups and things like that. And then I'd move on to the next town. So I started out in Iowa, Esterville, Iowa, Northwest Iowa, and was there for about a year and a half. And then I went to Western Nebraska, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, met, you know, so you meet people there. And then being involved in sports and sports broadcasting, you got to meet parents of the kids that were in the, on the high school teams and stuff. So it was a little bit easier, but still you had to decide, okay, which of these people you're going to be able to just kind of be more involved with. So mm -hmm. for example, there was uh, one kid whose parents were really cool. His dad owned a couple of uh, food places in town. His mom worked at the radio station with me as a saleswoman. And so during one season of basketball, I would travel with them. And it was great. It was a great experience. And then another season, you know, was uh, baseball a couple years later. And there was another parent, uh, a dad, who was a part of the 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 booster club. And so he'd pay for uh, some of my lodging and things like that to help defray costs of me broadcasting the games for the radio station. But I didn't travel with him. But so there was different components, like you said, like, one, I was able to actually be in the car, travel with them. We'd eat at the same restaurants, things like that. And then another guy was just, he'd just pay, uh, pay the bill, so to speak, so that I could broadcast <laughs> the game. So it was, you know, both were really cool experiences, mm -hmm. but just different dynamics. And so like you said, with your daughter having, you know, her, uh, her slew of friends, one for each different thing that she likes to do. Sometimes there are those relationships where you can have people that fulfill a need that's going to be different. And not every relationship is going to be the same. And you're not going to be able to base your decisions on every, you know, everything. There'll be times I'll go out and I'll think, okay, what do I want to do tonight? What do I want to do this weekend? And then I'll figure out who would best fit that exactly. scenario. And I'll exactly. be like, I'll ask them. Oh, I'm going to go right. to a, a, a sporting event. I'm going to ask this person. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to a concert. Well, maybe I'll ask this person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, so you have your circle of friends and they all are fulfilling different needs in you. And so that's the trap that people miss or not the trap, the, um, the beauty that people miss when they feel that if they're lonely, then, then let me go find a boyfriend or a girlfriend as opposed to let me find a community of friends that I can do life with that are going to be with me through thick and thin. And we... It's so important because things happen in life. It's not just, you know, going to restaurants and, and games and concerts. That's certainly a really great part of having a friend community. Those are the types of things that build your relationship, that strengthen the community, because at some point, life is going to happen for somebody. Somebody's going to get cancer. Somebody's mom's going to die. Um, some some tragedy is going to happen, Some some big life event. And guess what? You, the only thing you have to stand on at that point is the foundation that you've built up to that point. So if you don't have a community of friends, if you don't have a foundation that you have really invested in up to that point, it's going to be really difficult to go through that alone. And But if you have the community of friends, then when you go through something, people are there for you and they support you. The book that I wrote, uh, No Arms, No Legs, No Problem, 
when he when Bob lost all four of his limbs when when they were amputated at the age of nine, his family stepped in and and they really um, were the determining factor in his current success. He's now in his fifties, but. It's the people that we have around us. It's the people that we have invested in, the people who have invested in us. So those are the decisions. We have this, and again, I, I'm going to keep hammering on this. We think that the decisions are these bigger life decisions, but it, they're the small ones, especially as an adult, to get the help that I need, get the education that I need, um, invest in, in, in a community of friends, find a friend group to belong to. We have to reach out and get those things as an adult if we're wounded i had to heal from you know all of my rejection and abandonment issues because that holds us back um, we don't make good decisions in that in that posture so a lot of these decisions that we think are not important are way more important than any of the other decisions our character wherever you go there you are and so we have to make decisions to build our character on a regular basis if we're fearful then have someone help us, you know, with our fear. If we're insecure, if we're lonely, um, if we just need comfort all the time, you know, get with somebody that can help us overcome that because that's going to hold you back and keep you from being the person that you can be and really getting to the place in life where you want to to be. If I can bring it to a sports analogy, I was talking to a high school basketball coach, uh, high school basketball coach in Alliance, Nebraska, one time. And um, if you don't know anything about Alliance, if you know Carhenge, it's Alliance. Uh, <laughs> P.O.D., the music group, Youth of a Nation, YouTube it, and you'll see what I'm talking about when I ca- talk about Carhenge. But I was asking him one time because he was really successful. And I asked him in the youth of my broadcasting, in the Nebraska of my broadcasting youth, what made his team so successful? And you would expect we score more points than the other team, or we do this or do that. But it was the fundamentals of things. He said, you know, we would work on boxing out basketball, boxing out, making sure that on a rebound, a missed shot, we're Mm -hmm. boxing out and we're getting the ball. But we'd work on the fundamentals of boxing out, footwork, uh, passing the ball, um, you know, running the the offense, making sure that we ran the right angles and things like that. Or in football, I remember talking to another coach and he was telling me that, you know, it came down to making sure that the fundamentals were being executed properly. Mm-hmm. Because if you execute the fundamentals, if you get that pitch on the outside corner with two strikes, or if you put the ball in play and you get a ground ball the second with less than two outs and a run at third and you score that run, you do those little things, all those little things and those little decisions that becomes successful will equal a win in the ball game, hopefully. Yes. And you get bigger success from those little you know, successes that you have. But that's what it was. And so it's kind of like that. When you talk mm-hmm. about direct and indirect mm-hmm. decisions, you've got these big life decisions, where to go to school, what job am I going to do, who am I going to date, uh, should I, should not drink at this party. But it also comes down to if you make those little decisions, you know, should I even go, um, you know, what am I going to study, um, whatever it might be. Those can equal uh, just as that can bring you to the decision that you want to make on the bigger ones because mm-hmm. you have those little decisions already made. And it's kind of getting back to mm-hmm. those fundamentals. That's an excellent point. The fundamentals in, in sports, you know, those physical fundamentals, the drills, um, we have to do the same thing with our emotions. We have to have emotional drills and we have to have those fundamental emotional exercises that we put ourselves through. And a lot of that, honestly, is learning how to say no. Because if we want the bigger picture, if we want the job, if we want to buy the house, we have to say no to buying the little things that we want. When we are standing in the candy store, we have to say, no, I'm not. I'm going to deny myself, basically, is is a lot of it is I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to discipline myself, do the put myself through those emotional fundamental skills because you know, the decisions keep getting bigger and bigger as we get older and the discipline to say no to the to the candy in the candy store is the same discipline that we will need to save money to buy a house or to if we are married and um, we see somebody that that we want to have an affair with. It's the same discipline. It's that same, you know, we have this overarching goal and we have to say no to the to the little things Um, in light of the bigger picture. And so it's those fundamentals that we have to practice, those emotional exercises. We have to build our our emotional muscle. And a lot of us don't have the stomach for that. We just don't want to put ourselves through those paces. It's easier just to say, I'm going to go to bed early. Um, I'm going to sleep in late. I don't want to go right now. Um, You know, I'm not going to go for the run. 
and and the the more that we run away from those emotional disciplines and choose not to engage in them, the weaker and weaker we get. And that's when we start making these these decisions that are off of our radar that are taking us to another planet. And then we don't even we don't even notice it until we're way off track. And we're like, how did I get here? I noticed you didn't deny yourself Starbucks. You use candy instead of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> what about the Starbucks denying your 10 buck cup of coffee? No. Um. So I buy the Starbucks in the bag and I make it at home. Uh, and <laughs> But no, you make some valid points there uh, with that. But I just noticed that Starbucks is the big of thing course, that people of will course. delve their, dole their money off for. But then, okay, so let me ask you this then. So people make a decision, it backfires, then regret steps in or sets in and you have regret. Should people regret decisions they make because a lot oftentimes i don't regret anything i do and that may seem bad or whatever um, but i don't regret anything i do now things don't work out and in the radio business i get used to failure or decisions not working out because i'll try something on a radio show and it may work or may not work and then you try the next thing and you try the next thing so maybe i'm jaded towards you know failure in those little uh, scenarios because i've experienced it so much but i've also enjoyed great success but Regret when you make a decision and it doesn't work out. Do you regret it? So, for example, earlier I was talking about a decision that I made a few months ago that um, I took a little bit of a risk, kind of got burned. It kind of stings today. Do I regret that? I don't think so. I mean, I wish I could go over and make a different decision because you know you don't want to deal with the pain and all that stuff that comes with it. But do I regret those decisions? I don't think so. So, where does where does regret? play into decision making especially when things well things could go well, good or bad yeah my heart is like beating 100 miles an hour right now i'm thinking do i tell these stories do i not tell these stories <laughs> tell us <laughs> oh so scary so scary so yeah i do i do think that there is a place for regret i i it's i find it curious when people say that i have no regrets um because on one hand like you said we we need to take risk and we need to embrace failure. I've said it a hundred times that if we don't embrace failure, um, then we're not really doing anything. We're not learning. We're not moving forward. On the other hand, there are decisions and I'm, uh, gosh, I can't even like breathe. Um, so when we're in college, you know, thinking back to our college years, there's a lot of decisions that I regret. Now I forgive, you know, myself and I'm, um, a believer in God and Jesus. And so I've, um, gone through a lot of work in that area but i do regret that i made the decisions that i made in college and the reason that i partied a lot i drank a lot i um there were um situations of of sex that i regret and so i do regret that because i was not in charge of myself i was making decisions based on the fact that i was um really insecure that i needed to be loved um i have my rejection and abandonment issues were at an all-time not an all-time high i think that came a little bit later but i was such in a fog coming out you know when i went into college that i just wanted to be loved and so i did make a lot of decisions that um that i do regret because it because it took me down a path that um got me in trouble in some cases and then then as I got older, as I left college and I was in my 20s, I wasted so many years not getting healthy, not getting emotionally healthy because there were so many things that I was wounded from and had so many, so much baggage that I was carrying around. I regret that I didn't have someone to help me get rid of that earlier because I did waste a lot of years, w way too many years were just wasted like surviving like you know, who's going to love me and who's going to date me and, and, you know, why is this person treating me this way? And I wasn't in charge of myself. I was allowing other people to decide my decisions for me. I didn't have good boundaries. I didn't know how to say no. I didn't know how to stand up for myself. I didn't have a voice. And so I was going through life kind of, kind of as a people pleaser and allowing other people to dictate what I should or should not be doing. And and so I do, yeah, I, I regret highly all those wasted years because I'm a smart cookie and I've always been a good worker and um, I could have, you know, earlier in life, um, I could have really 
been a lot more successful earlier in life. And I do regret that. Now, did I learn from it? And did I, am I turning that around now? Yes. And is it shaping me who I am? And can I turn around and help other people and understand other people in that situation? Yes. Can God use things for good? Yes. But that doesn't mean that if I had the, you know, if I had the chance, you know, what I put myself on all those drinking party situations again, you know, gosh, I wish I didn't have to learn that way. No, I understand that. It makes sense. What I'm coming from for me is that everything I've gone through, everything that I've experienced, would there be some things I'd change? Yeah, I'd go back and change a few things. But everything I've gone through has made me who I am today. Those bad things I went through, I can now um, relate to other people that have gone through those things. Um, you talk about drinking parties and things like that. It sounds like you maybe have a little bit more of a wild side than I thought, uh, at least in the younger days. <laughs> you have no uh, but, idea. <laughs> but you think about those, because you know, we've all been there. We've all had those experiences. But it also makes me uh, relate to others that have gone through that. For example, if someone came to me and said, I'm on drugs, help me get off drugs. I would not be the best person for that because I've never done drugs. Mm -hmm. I don't know the experience. Of it. My favorite drug is alcohol. I'm not an alcoholic. People think I am, but I'm not because, you know, but I do enjoy adult beverage, a barley pop every now and then. But I would not be the best person to help someone get off drugs. I don't know the experience of it. Other things, I can help you out because I've experienced it. Um, and so some of those experiences I've gone through, is it regret? Would I change it? I'd change it, but I don't regret going through it because now I can relate to other people. And so even the, the scars that I carry, the emotional scars on myself, people don't realize I have them, but I do. Um, and, the, and the emotional strain that you know my brain keeps me up late at night thinking about things that I've gone through. Um, it's all a part of who I am, and it's mm -hmm. all a part of what makes me me, understands the person. And I think it even helps me as a professional level because I see students coming in and they've got all these different issues. Mm -hmm. I may not have experienced it, but I know that I have an, I've had issues in the past that may be similar, mm -hmm. and so I can help understand, or it helps me understand what other people are going through. So I would take the scars that I've gone through. Nobody likes to go through bad things. Nobody wants to go through hardship. Nobody wants to go through emotional struggle where your your soul is being strained and you're like sitting there trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to move forward? Um, but all those things have made me who I am today and make me understand what other people are going through. So that's why I say when I don't have regret, that's what I'm talking about. The things that I've gone through, would I have loved to have changed or not go through? But would I, would I give them up? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Because if I gave those, those hardships up, if I gave, you know, those lonely nights sitting at a radio station in Iowa, you know, just as an example, or if I gave up, you know, some relationship things, then I wouldn't have the experience to maybe help others get through what they're going through. Would I like not to be heartbroken? Absolutely. Would I like things to have worked out? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, say la vie, and now I can learn from that and grow from that and hopefully help others, but it makes me who I am today. I'm not jaded, I'm not uh, you know, out of the know, and so that's when I say regret not having it. That's what I'm talking about, is, is those things that we go through, those scars, those baggages that we have, as long as it's not controlling you and as long as it's not dictating your life. But, you know, it's kind of like. That's the part I think that I regret is that it was controlling me mm. and dictating my life. And I was allowing the baggage and allowing the pain and allowing the heartache to um, just kind of bump around in life. And I was not in control of my decisions. I was making the indirect decisions. Okay, I'm going to get out of bed today. I'm going to do this. I wasn't making purposeful decisions to get better. I was wasting time being hurt. I was wasting time blaming. That's the part that I regret. That makes sense. So can I can I use the things that have happened to me to help other people? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why I'm I'm sitting here. But I regret that it controlled me and I regret that I it took me so long to be an adult and to reach out for what I needed, to reach out for help, to reach out for resources to find a community of people who love me just for me um, because I, you know, I allowed those dark thoughts for so long to think, you know, that I wasn't loved or that people didn't want to be my friend and it wasn't true. So I, I regret the part that I was not, that I allowed it to control me and take me in a direction in life that was just a lot of chaos and it was just unnecessary i can never get those years back there were a lot of good years in there i don't want to make it sound like it's all you know gloom and doom and dark 
but there was a lot of unnecessary chaos. There was a lot of unnecessary struggles that just didn't have to happen. And, and if I would have um, sooner, if I would have gotten help sooner and, and, and taken control sooner, um, that would be good. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, as we, as we wrap things up here, any final words that you want to uh, share because it's been a, it's been a lot. It's a lot to digest. Decision making is not an easy process. There's a lot of things that can go into it. It could be a spur of the moment decision. It could be a decision that you ponder for years. It could be a decision about making a move someplace else, like I said, buying a house, what kind of job, or it could be something a lot more. Should I get involved with a person? Should I do this? You know, whatever the case may be, there's going to be consequences to those decisions, good or bad. Regret it's up to you if you want them to to regret that. But um, all in all. I would say this, for me personally, it's take into consideration, take into consideration all the information, Mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Look at all the angles if you possibly can and try to make the best decision. There's no guarantees that that decision is gonna work. There might be some setback, there might be some heartbreak, there might be some failure in there, but that's gonna be okay too. Don't let that define you and don't let that baggage keep you going. Don't be that you know wedding car that has the shoes and the tin cans and things like that dragging behind, keeping you down. Don't let that be the anchor mm-hmm. to your life. You know, But you can utilize those things to make you a better person and be the person you are. But then just go for it too. Take a little bit of a risk. If you decide that it's okay with all the, the information that you have, that it's okay to move forward, go for it. You know, Don't let failure or don't let the fear of failure hinder your decision making. But then also be smart about it too. Seek wise counsel, seek people out if you want and get some uh, some feedback from others, you know, ping things off of mentors or people that you respect. Um, and then also just be cautious of the people who are influencing you because there could be some motives there as to why they're giving you the information that they're giving you. It could be because they wanna see you fail. It could be because they're jealous of you. It could be because they are envious of you. Uh, who knows what the reason is? So you want to make sure that the information that you're getting come from good people, people that you can trust, and then make the decision and then stick with it. Don't hem and haw about it. If it fails, then go back to the drawing table and make a new decision on something else. If it works, hey, that's great. Decisions are going to be every day. We make millions of decisions from waking up in the morning, brushing our teeth, eating our breakfast, driving to school, work, whatever, to the bigger life decisions. Just don't let those decisions uh, or the outcomes affect you as much as you might want to because it's life. Mm -hmm. And like Aerosmith said, I believe it was Aerosmith, life's a journey, not a destination. (laughs) Ride the journey because... Oftentimes, like in radio, I wanted, I started out in Iowa and I wanted to get to the big time and I didn't really enjoy the ride as much as I should have Mm -hmm. because I was too busy, you know, trying to get to the top. And now I think back at some of the things that I've done over those years in those smaller towns and I'm thinking, man, that was a lot of fun. I should have enjoyed it a little bit more. You know, it's a journey. It's a journey to get to the end. Life goes by so fast that in the blink of an eye, you know, we're staring out of a coffin. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you make the most of those decisions and have fun with life, and don't sweat the little details, but just go for it. Take the risk, make good decisions, and you'll be fine. And I would say, I would add to that, uh, take those self-assessment tests, take uh, the personality test, um, get some counseling, get a mentor, find out um, who you are and what you bring to the table, because I think you will be amazed at how much beauty there is inside of your soul that is just sitting there untapped and and because of there's all these other clouds covering it up. And so when you find out who you are, find out what you're made of, find out what makes you tick, then you can start looking at your core values and start making decisions in light of what it is that you personally want out of life. And then it's so much easier to say yes or to say no. And it's so much easier to make decisions when you know who you are, what you're about, where you want to be, you know, 5, 10, 20 years from now, it's a lot easier when you have a, a mission statement, a purpose statement, a vision for your life, then you can gauge every decision off of that. Is this decision going to take me towards my mission or is it going to take me away from it? And then it's a lot easier to make that decision. Don't give up on yourself. You are worth it. And uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Two Steps Ahead Podcast. You can DM us there, uh, follow us there. We'll put clips up, pictures, things like that. Also, uh, my personal Instagram is at Edom Rocks, E I D E M R O C K S. And you can email us at Two Steps Ahead Podcast at gmail.com. And your Instagram is Tara Hoke Shiro. 
T-A-R-A-H-O-K-E-S-C-H-I-R-O. Hey, we'd just like to thank you for being with us. This is Two Steps Ahead, a podcast where we hopefully give you a little bit of advice and basically basically just learn from our experience and uh, maybe take with it what you might. Uh, so thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time.